The chain rattled underneath me. Its foreboding vibrations raced throughout my body. I could barely breathe. My heart was pounding like a kettle drum during the climax of some serious-sounding opera. I was safely strapped in place. However, it felt more like being trapped in a death chair to which there was no escape, at least for the next two minutes and 43 seconds. For me, this was the epitome of terror, an out-of-control experience that I considered a death simulator. For everyone else, it was a cheap thrill. But for some, a religion, as it was to become for Samantha. She sat in the seat next to me, her eyes closed, taking in the warm air amidst the deafening chain rattle, as if deep in prayer. She was calm, stoic, a far cry from the nervous wreck that I was. Maybe that's what attracted me to her, that sense of adventure she wore like a warm blanket. I was so plain and safe that I had no idea what she saw in me. Perhaps she enjoyed dragging out the daredevil I never thought was in me. I often wondered what I gave her in return. Our relationship at that point was like the train we were riding in, starting to climb and almost to the top. It was nothing but fresh and new feelings. One thing was certain. I knew that I liked her, and more than I should have, especially this early on. Indeed, I was falling for her, and as we reached the top of that hill, I remember wondering if she thought the same. My legs wobbled beneath me as we walked back into the park from the exit. I did my best to come across as a triumphant stud who just took on a towering inferno, rather than the tepid wimp I most certainly was. Samantha, on the other hand, walked with an extra sway in her step. There was an energy inside her pouring out for all to see. I suppose that's how he singled her out. I first noticed him while we were in line for that first dreaded coaster. He was a short, normal-looking guy. Nothing to brag about with his bushy hair and tinted, thick-rimmed glasses. He looked like a nerd on steroids. However... He seemed to be the center of attention amongst his company. They were an even mix of male and female, who all wore matching colorful tie-dyed shirts. I remember thinking they were part of some social club or a youth group, maybe. Harmless and having fun. I walked proudly alongside Samantha, smitten, trying to enjoy the sights the Six Flags Park had to offer. I've always found this place to be unsettling, with an anything-goes type of feel, like a local neighborhood carnival, but on a much larger scale. Any time you hear of a roller coaster death, or some kind of amusement park tragedy, it always seems to be at Six Flags. Magic Mountain, in Southern California, was no exception. I've seen gang riots, a shooting, stabbings, countless good old-fashioned fistfights. I guess it's the rise that attract an element, and those seeking a danger they provide. Rides with names like Full Throttle or Viper, it's no wonder the place has a bad rap. But it was because of Samantha that I was there, and I did my best at pretending to have fun as we stood in line for our second coaster of the day. Interestingly, behind us were the group of tie-dye-wearing riders from before, led by that small, nerdy-looking guy. I thought it was just a coincidence that they would choose the same ride as us. However, I noticed the little guy constantly looking in our direction. He was looking at Samantha. We lined up to Sam's favorite spot on the train. The front, of course. It wasn't surprising who lined up directly behind us. He was even more bizarre than from when I saw him further down the queue. His eyes were enlarged behind his thick glasses, and he seemed to look at things with a deep intensity. Despite this little guy's quirky looks, he was well-kept. His group, however, was a disheveled bunch of folks. 
especially the dreadlock guy who I could still smell four or five spaces away. They looked tired, but doing their best to put on a happy face. I noticed them passing around a few junk food items and soda cups, sharing the food and eating as if they hadn't had a meal in weeks. And it's here that I got a good look at their matching t-shirts that each read, Writers for Joseph, clear across the front. Samantha didn't pay as much attention to them as I did, and how could I not, with a little guy practically looking right through me to see her? When our train came into the station and we all boarded, he still couldn't take his eyes off her, but I had no time to really think about that. I was strapped into another death simulator, and a big one at that. We climbed and climbed, and climbed even more. I'd later learn that this was among the top five tallest coasters in the world. I was not prepared for what was to come, both mentally and physically. It didn't help that the riders for Joseph were all sitting behind us and singing some generic church hymn at the tops of their lungs. If they didn't have Samantha's attention before, they most certainly had it now. She seemed to be fueled by the singing, as if a sleeping giant had now been awoken. As we descended into G-Force Hell, I had a bad feeling. Hypercoaster was the term used for this particular attraction, and it fit perfectly. Especially the last helix that forced upon me 4.5 Gs. It was enough to make me gray out and almost lose consciousness. I fumbled out of the train with rubber band legs as the riders kept singing, even as they deboarded and filtered through the exit back into the park. This was where Samantha laid her beautiful green eyes on them for the first time. It was love at first sight. I quickly rushed her along, asking what our next ride should be, hoping to cockblock the little guy, who was clearly advancing in her direction. I took her hand and asserted my manhood. It worked, at least for that moment. But I would notice Sam peeking over her shoulder, the curiosity taking hold. My jealousy increased with each step we took away from that awful church singing. We went on steel monstrosity after monstrosity, and it seemed each one was more treacherous than the previous. It was pure hell for me, but the look on Sam's face made it all worthwhile. She had a perfect smile that could brighten anyone's day. I could tell riding these ridiculous coasters was bringing her a happiness hidden deep inside. I knew behind her gorgeous exterior there was a sadness. Something always seemed to be troubling her. Maybe this is what attracted me the most. The thought that I would be the one to come to her rescue. I was willing to do almost anything, especially to protect her. As the day went on, I... Noticed a few of the riders showing up here and there. Some would be in line on the same rides as us. Some would be sitting a few tables over as we had lunch. If I didn't know any better, I'd say they were following us. Or, more to the point, following Sam. She didn't seem to notice the way I did, but perhaps that was because she wasn't looking. I certainly wasn't going to point it out, potentially ruining an otherwise nice day. But, of course, on our last ride, standing in line right behind us, was the entire group, and within their center, the little guy. He was preaching to them as they waited in a somewhat lengthy line. His pretentiousness oozed out of him when he sauntered along, preaching as if in a church service. And his group was riveted hanging on each and every word he spoke. At times, his volume would rise, demanding a reaction from them and everyone in line. Because Jesus was the son of Joseph, he exclaimed at one point. 
His message was hard to follow. At its core, it was one of redemption. From what, exactly, I still don't know to this day. It seemed everyone else in line was just as disturbed as I was, except for Sam. She was listening. I kept trying to spark a distracting conversation with her, but getting over this man's commanding voice proved to be difficult. It was hard not to hear him and sense the control he had over his frail and malnourished group. It was intimidating. After almost forty minutes of waiting and listening to an unexpected ceremony, we had finally reached the boarding zone. Of course, Samantha wanted to sit up front, to which we had to wait a few extra cycles. And as we did, the riders had come and gone, singing as they ascended and hooting and hollering as they came back into the station. It's there that I met eyes with the little guy as he exited his train. And this time, he was looking at me. That final ride was the most memorable for me that day. It wasn't exactly the scariest of coasters we took on. I think maybe it was because I knew this was going to be our last ride together. Ever. There was something in the pit of my stomach that was telling me I'd never see Sam again after this. We were having fun, but there was an invisible barrier between us. I hated feeling that way. I liked being with her so much it hurt me to think that it wouldn't work out between us. But these feelings were also fueled by the riders for Joseph, who stood in a chorus line waiting for us to exit. As we came out, they all began singing to us, or more to the point, singing to Sam. Our God reigns. They sang in unison, sounding like a less than average grade school choir. I'd never seen anything like it. The other park patrons began to gather slightly, both with curiosity, but mostly confusion. Some of the writers broke off and began handing pamphlets out to the onlookers. That's when the little guy finally approached us and handed one to Sam. He looked at her with those intense eyes, magnified behind his glasses. This is for you, he said softly. Sam took the pamphlet from him as I pulled her away from that bizarre and wretched scene. On the way home, she was buried deep in whatever literature was in the pamphlet, ignoring the fact that I was even there. Attempting to get her attention was futile. It was as if the word she was reading paralyzed her. Perhaps gripped is a better word. I politely asked if she could share what they, the writers of Joseph, were all about, hoping to get into a conversation. A way out, she replied as she stared out the window. We rode in silence the rest of the way home. I dropped her off, knowing that, even though plans were made for us to have lunch the next day, I'd never see her again. A few weeks passed, and I accepted the fact that it was over between us. She had flaked on her lunch date, and then ghosted me the weeks that followed. I gave up on my texts and calls, attempting to save as much self-esteem and dignity as I could. I got the hint, and besides being devastated, I was puzzled. She not only ghosted me, but also anyone whom she was acquainted with. Sam, it seemed, had simply disappeared. There was a part of me that didn't want to care. She practically ripped my heart out and stepped on it with absolutely no explanation whatsoever. But I couldn't. This was the toughest thing to face, no matter how many times I tried to put it behind me. I had fallen for her deeper than I cared to admit. Call it obsession if you want, but I decided to go and look for her. Something about it all just didn't add up. 
I began my search with the Riders for Joseph pamphlet she had left in my car. It was a disturbing read. Its words were mashed together as if created by someone with fourth grade skills. The point was simple. To ride roller coasters for the father of Jesus, Joseph. According to the pamphlet, the riders were a small group of young men and women who had dedicated their lives to honoring, as they put it, the forgotten father of the Son of God, who was Joseph. And that was it, plain and simple. How their peripheral activity, like riding roller coasters, was fundamental to the purpose of giving praise to the Father of the Son of God was anyone's guess. Absurd is what it really was. I was shocked by how this word salad of a pamphlet could ever speak to someone like Samantha. Perhaps there were subliminal things in there a dummy like me could never understand. Any information I got on the group up to that point were from random posts of people who had seen them at Magic Mountain, all of whom had weird stories of their own. It was almost by chance that I stumbled across a Facebook profile that gave me the only lead to Samantha. After a few more months of digging around, I finally got my answer to where she was. The Facebook page belonged to an exiled member who was more than willing to tell me details about her former group. She joyfully referred to them as the fuck-ups, and was a key member for only eight months before being replaced. The little guy, it seemed, was never satisfied with her levels of commitment, and was always looking for a more dedicated individual. She said her replacement, the new girl, was a pretty brunette from Southern California. I knew exactly who it was. I expressed my interest in joining, and asked where I could get in touch with him. The number on the pamphlet was disconnected. You're too late. It's over, she said. She explained. With her departure and the new replacement, the little guy finally had the team he wanted. A team for what? I asked. The final ride, she replied. The rejection in her voice chilled me, right down to my toes. I asked her when and where this final ride would take place. It started a few weeks ago, she said. I was a few hours outside of Los Angeles, heading north on Interstate 15. I managed to coerce scant directions from the young woman as to where this final ride was taking place. It was a short distance west of a town called Yermo, near the old Calico Mines. I knew exactly where this area was. I'd been there many times before going to Calico Ghost Town with my parents as a kid. Out here, there's a whole lot of nothing. I drove endlessly into this nothing, down deserted roads and past old hollowed-out gas stations, until I came to a scrapyard. I stopped my car and immediately heard the low rumble of what sounded like a machine. I got out and walked towards it, its monotonous clatter leading me deeper into the heaps of old scrap and debris left over from the gold rush. The sound now became instantly familiar. I looked on as a train roared along the old and decrepit wooden monster standing before me. It cornered the tight helixes at each end, traversing its hills in between with fierce power and momentum. Metal wheels screamed against old wooden tracks, at ear-piercing decibels. I walked closer as the train climbed the main hill, where it would soon descend and repeat the course. A frail old man came out from under the chain carriage, his face almost covered in axle grease. His mechanic's jumpsuit stained with fresh oil and grease. In his hand, a large, dirty wrench. He looked at me puzzled as he scooted my way. Help you, son? he asked. I stood frozen. The man smiled and took a place next to me, looking at the patchwork wooden beast in front of us. 
Built it myself, he said proudly. Runs like a champ. I glanced over to him. He looked back at me, his intense eyes magnified behind his thick glasses. It looked all too familiar. And then I saw his name embroidered on the upper left chest of his jumpsuit. Joe. I ran up to the coaster as it made a descent. And there, in the front row, was Sam. Sitting next to her was the little guy. Behind them were the rest of the riders for Joseph, all slumped over and most likely dead from a non-stop ride that was happening for who knows how long. A final ride. Their movements were stiff like crash test dummies, lifeless and cold. They all wore colorful matching tie-dyed shirts, except for Samantha and the little guy. She wore a wedding dress and he a tuxedo. My heart sank into the lowest depths. My beloved Sam. I could never imagine what drove her to this madness. The old man scooted closer as I watched the train endure its two-and-a-half-minute route then climb again to repeat. He put a grease-stained hand on my shoulder. This is how a son honors his father, he boasted. As I drove away from that awful place, I couldn't control my mixture of emotions. The disturbing satisfaction I had tossing the frail old man onto the tracks and watching his body split in half from his own creation. A sick jealousy of the little guy taking Sam for his bride. And the deep sadness looking into my rearview mirror as black smoke rose into the air after setting that wooden monster ablaze. I knew, within the flame and smoke, Samantha was making her final ascent, where I hoped she'd find some peace. One thing was for sure, the next time I take that special someone to an amusement park, it's going to be Disneyland.